What's up everybody, it's Dan from SageMathTutoring.com and we have a video where we're going to be covering some university level math problems. So let's dive right in. Um, let's see, using the guidelines above, find all required information and sketch the graph of each of the following. Label all key information in the graph. So there is the uh, information up here. So anytime you're dealing with a parabola or a quadratic function, it looks like the professor wants the intercepts, the vertex, the range, minimum of one point on either side of the vertex. So these are all the criteria that we need to, you know, we need to sort of answer these questions uh, for each of these situations. And the criteria that you need to fulfill for each of these different graphs is slightly different. So looking at problem number one, uh, that is most definitely a quadratic function right there. Uh, of course, it's a version of f of x equals x squared, but there's some transformations happening. So uh, I would say to go through the specific motions that the professor seems to be looking for. First, the professor is looking for inter intercepts. Well, basically, um, for the intercepts, you're going to want to uh, find out what x equals when y is 0 and find out what y equals when x is 0. Uh, one way of sort of summarizing that process is to do x, y here, put a zero here, put a zero there. So let's first find out what happens when x is zero. In other words, let's find out what f of zero is. That would be zero minus four squared minus nine, and that's gonna be uh, 16 minus nine, and that would be um, 16 minus nine is seven so we know for a fact that when x is zero y is seven and then we could find out well what about when y is zero what does x equal so then you would set the entire function equal to zero and then solve for x uh, in this case we're going to get two answers probably adding nine to both sides would give us this uh taking the square root of both sides would give us this so you do want to be careful with the plus minus part, and then adding four to both sides would give us four plus minus three, and therefore x equals seven and uh, four minus three, which is one. So what that means is that there are really uh, two x-intercepts. We have uh, an x-coordinate of one and an x-coordinate of seven. Now what that means is uh, the points one comma zero exist on this graph and the points comma uh, seven comma zero also exists on the graph and we also know from this first part uh, that the point zero comma seven exists on this graph so we can kind of uh, do that right now actually just kind of plot those points because we're going to have to do that anyway we have one zero and then seven zero so already we can kind of get a sense of what this parabola is going to look like it's going to be kind of like that probably right so at this point, they also want the vertex. Now the vertex is very easily found when it's in this form. Uh, the vertex is literally just gonna be based off of this number and this number. And in this case, we're looking at four comma negative nine. That's the vertex. Uh, we can go ahead and plot that as well. Four comma negative nine, that would be down here. Okay. Uh, let's see what else they want. They want the range. Well, uh, I think it should be obvious by now that the parabola looks something like this. And when you graph it, you can sort of see what the range is. Uh, the range is clearly everything from negative nine up. Okay, everything from negative nine up. And the way to say that is that you could say range colon, um, uh, negative nine is included, so we're gonna get brackets there negative nine all the way to infinity and there's always parentheses next to infinity so we've satisfied the range part um, minimum one point on either side of the vertex so that part's going to be relatively easy for these you could bust out the x y column thing again and uh, let's put the vertex in the middle we know that the vertex is four comma negative nine and i would say let's just work with the x uh, values um, we could test out the x value of three we could test out the x value of five and let's actually look at the x value of five when you plug five into this it would be five minus four which is one one squared is one and one minus nine 
is negative eight, so that would be true here. Now, since this um, five is one unit away from four, and this three is also one unit away from four, that means that there's gonna be this symmetry going on, so that also has to be negative eight. So what we've just accomplished is we just found two additional points on either side of the vertex. So we're looking at three comma negative eight, which is right here. And then we have five comma negative eight, which is right here. Okay, so that kind of makes sense. Obviously my graph doesn't look too good, but you get the idea. Uh, let's see, minimum one point, axis of symmetry. Okay, so the axis of symmetry will always be X equals something. And what is that? Well, it's gonna be the X coordinate of the vertex. That's what it's gonna be, okay? So that's relatively easy to find when you're dealing with the function in vertex form, okay? Um, now, it is a little trickier when the function is in standard form like this. Uh, you're gonna have to do something else to find the axis of symmetry, okay? But anyway, we've satisfied all the requirements there, so let's move on to the next one. Okay, looking at problem number two, so uh, same deal, intercepts, well, uh, we could find out what f of zero is. In other words, use this uh, scenario here. f of zero is negative one half, uh, zero plus three squared plus four, and we are therefore looking at negative one half. Uh, looks like that's gonna be nine ultimately plus four. So that's negative nine over two plus eight over two, which is uh, negative one half. So we know that zero comma negative one half exists on this graph. Uh, when we try to find the x-intercepts, we would have to set y equal to zero and solve for x. We're looking at one half um, x plus three squared plus four. We could then subtract four from both sides. We're looking at this and uh, at that point, point we can uh, multiply both sides by by negative two over one which is the reciprocal of negative one half we're going to multiply both sides by negative two over one that gives us an eight over here and then we have this uh, we can then take the square root of both sides which would give us plus minus the square root of eight which i'm going to worry about in a moment uh, then we have a matter of subtracting three Subtracting three from both sides, we have negative three plus minus uh, the square root of eight, and that equals x. Now, uh, it's possible the teacher wants you to simplify square root of eight. So the reality is that the square root of eight is secretly the square root of two times the square root of four, and the square root of four is clearly just two, and that could therefore be written as two radical two, okay? So perhaps the best way to uh, write the answer as negative 3 plus 2 radical 2, and you could also say negative 3 minus 2 radical 2. Uh, they would go here and here. I'm not going to write it because I don't really have enough room, but those would be the x-intercepts right there. Um, it does appear as though the teacher does want you to present these as points, though. So, for example, you know, one of the points would therefore be um, negative 3 plus 2 radical 2 comma 0. That's one of the x-intercepts. The other x-intercept is negative 3 minus 2 radical 2, 0. Okay, so we want to make sure we're doing what the professor wants. Uh, with regards to the vertex itself, uh, pretty easy to find. That's clearly going to be, as you can see just by looking at this problem here, uh, the vertex is going to be based on this number and this number. And the vertex is therefore negative 3 comma 4. Uh, I'm going to say let's start plotting some of these points. We have 0 comma negative 1 half, which would be ultimately, where would that be? So 0 comma negative 1 half would be right there. Uh, we also have a vertex of negative 3 comma 4. Uh, I think we all agree that that would be right there. Um, then we have the x-intercepts. So one of them is at negative 3 plus 2 radical 2 comma 0. So uh, you could use a calculator to figure that out. That would basically be like around here. And then if you used your calculator to figure this one out, that would be um, around here. 
and pretty good so far. Uh, before I actually grab it, though, let's get those two extra points, right? Um, so the vertex goes in the middle. We have negative three comma four. Let's try negative four. Let's try negative two. When you plug negative two into the original equation, that would be negative two plus three in there, which is just one. One squared is just one. Negative one half uh, times one is negative one half. Negative one half plus four is 3.5. Okay, 3.5. And due to symmetry, there would be a 3.5 right here as well. So we're looking at negative 4 comma 3.5, which is here. And we have negative 2 comma 3.5, which is right there. So that looks pretty good. Uh, so that's that. Now, once you've graphed it, it's actually pretty easy to see the range. Now, let's be very careful. Uh, the range, I should have maybe mentioned the range before, but sometimes graphing it first is actually good to, before you do the range. So the range goes all the way from negative infinity up to this number, okay? So it's important that you understand. We're looking at parentheses, negative infinity, all the way up to that positive four, and positive four is included. Okay, so that's the range. Um, uh, what else? Axis of symmetry, once again, we're looking at x equals the x coordinate of the vertex, which is negative three. So let's say you do that one. Okay, so with regards to the next one, the next one's definitely a parabola as well, but I'm gonna stick with the way that the professor wants to do this, um, which is a little different than the way I was trained, but I wanna keep it consistent with what the professor appears to want. So basically, uh, this is written in standard form. Now, the professor doesn't refer to this as standard form. Uh, the professor is referring to this as standard form, but my training tells me that this is called vertex form, and this is called standard form, okay? But the bottom line is the professor seems to be very um, much in favor of actually turning this into vertex form, and the professor has a very specific way that she likes the students to go about it, okay, which is kind of different than from my training as well. Usually I'm used to turning uh, a quadratic function from standard form into vertex form by completing the square, but the professor does it in a slightly different way. Uh, now, this is really important because, uh, you know, when you are finding Uh, all this information, well, we kind of already know what to do because we just did problem number one, problem number two, and we know very well how to navigate the vertex form. So basically, we're going to go on this initial mission of turning this into vertex form. Now, how does the teacher do it? Well, the teacher first finds the axis of symmetry, and the axis of symmetry is this. It's negative b over 2a. Now, in the case of problem number three, uh, a is the first coefficient, which is 3, b is the second coefficient, which is 12, and c is the uh, constant, which is seven. So uh, we're looking at an axis of symmetry of negative three over two times, actually, pardon me, uh, negative 12, pardon me, over two times three, right? Uh, so that is uh, negative 12 divided by six, which is negative two. Now, yes, that's the axis of symmetry. So in a way, we've already satisfied one of these answers here, but we also need to acknowledge that not only is that the axis of symmetry, but it's also the x coordinate of the vertex. Well, how do you find the y coordinate of the vertex? Well, that's very easy. You just plug negative two into the function and then figure out what the y value is. So we're looking at three times negative two squared plus 12 times negative two plus seven. So we're looking at three times four, which is 12, uh, minus 24 plus 7. So that's negative 12 plus 7, a.k.a. negative 5. Now, what do you do with that information? Well, first of all, you recognize that, congratulations, you have the axis of symmetry, uh, which is this, but we also have the vertex, don't we? We know what the vertex is now. It's negative 2 comma negative 5. And the beautiful thing about that is it once you have the vertex, it's actually pretty easy to write the um, vertex form. Now, it's, you do want to be careful because you want to preserve that leading coefficient, though. So this is going to become f of x equals 3 
times x plus 2, right? You've got to switch the sign, squared minus 5. Okay, so we've just successfully turned the standard form, what I'm calling the standard form, into the vertex form. And at this point, we can uh, find out the rest of the information, okay? Now, we again, we've already satisfied finding the vertex. We've already satisfied finding the axis of symmetry. Uh, let's go ahead and find the um, intercepts. So we got zero, we got zero. So when x is zero, when x is zero, um, what does y equal? Well, that would be zero plus two, which is two, two squared, which is four, four times three, which is 12, 12 minus five, which is seven. Okay, uh, when y is zero, well, as you know, that would just be a matter of setting f of x, the entire thing, equal to zero, and then solving for x. Very often we get two answers, but we'll find out. So we're going to have five. We got three times x plus two squared. Um, at that point, we are looking at five over three equals x plus two squared. Taking the square root of both sides would give us radical 5 over 3 equals x plus 2. Solving for x would give us a negative 2, negative 2 plus minus radical 5 over 3. So uh, the teacher will probably prefer the radical 5 over 3 to be adjusted because the reality is, is that that's really just radical 5 over radical 3. And we're going to want to rationalize the denominator. So we're going to multiply the top and bottom by radical 3. As a result, this would become radical 15 over 3. So really, the uh, x-intercepts, we could say, uh, the x-coordinates of the x-intercepts, at least, would be negative 2 plus minus radical 15 over 3. Okay, uh, If we were to write that as points, uh, you could say this. This is one of them, and zero. And this is the other one, negative two minus radical 15 over three comma zero. So those are the x-intercepts. Um, we also need to find those points that are on either side of the vertex. So let's go ahead and do that. Uh, the vertex will be in the middle. We're looking at negative two comma negative five. Uh, let's try out negative 3. Let's try out negative 1. Uh, if you were to put in negative 3 uh, into this, it would be negative 3 plus 2, which is negative 1. Negative 1 squared is just positive 1. Positive 1 times 3 is 3. 3 minus 5 is um, 3 minus 5 is negative 2. And due to symmetry, we would have a negative 2 right there as well. So uh, let's plot some of these points. Negative 2 comma negative 5. That's right here. Um, negative 3 comma negative 2, that would be right around there. And negative 1 comma negative 2 would be right around there. Um, we also know that we have a y-intercept, I believe, uh, right here. That's 0 comma 7. So that's right here. Uh, we also have uh, these x-intercepts, which are kind of weird. Uh, negative 2, you could always, again, use, use a calculator. I mean, if you're presented with these sort of radical things, just go ahead and use a calculator, I would say. Uh, and if you were to use a calculator and figure out the x-intercepts, uh, you would have one around here and you would have one around there. And that is certainly enough information. So we're looking at this. And once you've graphed it, then maybe you want to find the range. Uh, the range is clearly going from negative five to infinity. Now, in case they ask for the domain of parabolas, just know the domain is going to be all real numbers. You could always say, I don't know, D colon and this fancy looking R, okay? So that would be how you do that one. Um, hopefully that makes sense. We're going to move on to the next one. Okay, so now we are looking at problem number Four. Now, this is the first time where we're dealing with a cubic function. Now, a cubic parent function looks something like this, okay? So just to keep that in mind, that would be like y equals x cubed. So this is a variation of that, but we're going to kind of pay attention to what their expectations are. So we have a uh, cubic function. We're going to want the intercepts. We're going to want a reference point, the transformation of 0, 0. Uh, 
uh, one point on either side of the reference point. Okay, that's fine. So it's actually not that much if you think about it. Um, well, the intercept uh, intercepts are going to be relatively easy enough. Uh, the same philosophy and same strategy would apply in that you would want to do this whole thing where it's like zero, zero. Uh, when x is zero, it looks like it's going to be one cubed, which is one minus eight, which is negative seven. Uh, if y was zero, you know, we could always kind of do that off to the side. Zero equals x plus one cubed minus eight. You can add eight to both sides. You would have x plus one cubed equals eight. Uh, you could then take the cube root of both sides. Now, you do not need a plus minus when you do that. You just preserve whatever the sign was here. You just keep that. So it was a positive eight, so it's going to be a positive two. And then we have x plus 1. Once again, that's the cube root of 8. The cube root of 8 is 2. That's what we did. We took the cube root of both sides to get rid of that. Uh, at that point, we can subtract 1 from both sides. Clearly, we have x equals 1. So there's only one x-intercept, which actually makes sense. Okay, so it's at that one. Now, uh, it does appear the professor wants you to sort of track the reference point. Now, the, what, what does the teacher mean by the reference point? Well, the, the reference point in the parent function is this point right here. It's this point zero, zero, right? And this uh, point was subject to numerous transformations, okay? So it used to be, this is what the parent function used to be. The reference point used to be that, right? But unfortunately, what happened is there were some transformations. There were horizontal transformations and there were vertical transformations. Well, what are the horizontal transformations? Well, it went to the left one according to this okay went to the left one so i'm going to go like that what about uh, vertical any vertical transformations well yes it shifted down eight so it went down eight so all that means is you then update the reference point you update the reference point and this one went to the left one so that's going to be zero minus one which is negative one this one went down 8, so that's going to be 0 minus 8, which is negative 8. So there's your new reference point. Now, it is the case that the teacher wants two points on either side of that reference point, so I'm actually going to erase this. Uh, I'm going to put negative 1 and 8 in the middle, negative 1 and negative 8 in the middle, and we'll just kind of figure out some values over here. I think zero is good and negative two is good. Now at this point, all we have to do is just plug that into this. So uh, let's actually start with zero. So when zero goes in there, it's gonna be zero plus one, which is one, one cubed, which is one, one minus eight, which is uh, one minus eight, which is negative seven. That does seem familiar. Uh, yeah, that would literally be, makes sense. That would literally be the y-intercepts. Um, then we have negative two. Um, so we're looking at plugging negative two in there. Now you want to be careful. There's not symmetry here. This is not symmetrical. It's symmetrical about the origin, but it's not symmetrical across the y axis. So you can't use that shortcut when it comes to the cubic functions. So negative two plugged in. Negative two plus one is negative one. Negative one cubed is negative one. And negative one minus eight is negative nine. Okay. So there's are three points. Now, there is a little overlap as it pertains to this point. So maybe to stay on the safe side, we could also test out the point associated with the x-coordinate of 1. So if you put the x-coordinate of positive 1 in here, that would be 1 plus 1, which is 2. 2 cubed, which is 8, and then 8 minus 8 is 0. So that should certainly satisfy the professor. Um, what else? What else? What else? Intercepts, reference point, one point on either side of the reference point. Okay. Yeah, pretty good. So we're looking at negative 2 comma negative 9. That's down here. We are looking at negative 1 comma negative 8. That is right here. We're looking at 0 comma negative 7. That is right here. We're looking at 1 comma 0. That's right here. Okay. So it looks like what's going on, and we don't really have enough room on the graph, really, to sort of show it. But... Um, Oh, also zero comma negative seven. We already had that one comma zero. Okay, so yeah, what what it is is it's 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 the same shape generally, but then it kind of goes like that off to the graph, you know, off to the side of the graph.
Okay, so, you know, the reference point is right here, and that just got shifted down, so it's like right there. Anyway, I think my student probably understands that the range is all real numbers because it goes down infinity all the way up to positive infinity, and the domain is all real numbers because it goes to the left forever, and then it goes from, the, from forever to the left all the way forever to the right. Uh, so these are going out also. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. Okay, looking at um, problem number five. So that is a sideways parabola. Uh, they want the intercepts, the vertex, the domain, the minimum one point on either side of the vertex and the axis of symmetry. So what the typical graph of a sideways parabola would be, would be along the lines of this, okay? It would be like that. All right, so we know we're gonna be dealing with something like that, okay? Uh, so let's see. Well, they want the intercepts, so we could go ahead and create that little table, right? Uh, this philosophy will still apply, or this strategy will still apply um, to this guy. Uh, so when x is zero, y is gonna equal something, and when y is zero, x is gonna equal something. Let's actually try that first. When y is zero, um, when y is zero in this particular problem, uh, it would be zero minus two, which is negative two, negative two squared, which is positive four, and four minus nine is negative five. So that's right there. Now, when x is zero, that's a different story. We're gonna have to kind of do that now. So zero equals y minus two squared minus nine, add nine to both sides. You end up with y minus two squared equals that. Uh, taking the square root of both sides, we're looking at plus minus three equals y minus two, adding two to both sides, we got two plus minus three equals y. And then we are looking at clearly, um, you know, y equals, um, what is it, five and two minus three is negative one. So we can say negative one comma five right there. Uh, so if the teacher literally wants the points, well, we're looking at zero comma negative one and zero comma five. And then the um, other one would be negative five comma zero. Okay, so let's actually graph this and get our bearings a little bit. Zero comma negative one's right here. Zero comma positive five is, actually, no, pardon me. Zero comma negative one's right here, my bad. Zero comma positive five is right here. And we have negative five comma zero, negative five comma zero, that's right there. Okay, so another thing we have to do is we have to find the um, vertex, right? Well, imagine this was like a normal parabola, uh, an upright parabola. Well, what, the sort of doppelganger version would be this, and we would know that the vertex would be 2 comma negative 9. Uh, so you want to kind of think about that, but just know that when you have this, it's just going to be flipped. So the vertex of this thing is going to be negative 9, 2. Okay, so that's important that you realize that. Just imagine that it's a normal situation, find out what the vertex would be under that circumstance, and then flip these around. So we're looking at negative 9, comma, positive 2. So, um, great, right? And let's... Uh, Let's put that here in the middle, negative nine comma positive two, because we are going to want to uh, find points on either side of that, right? Uh, let's see, what else do they want? Uh, the domain minimum one point of either side of the vertex. Okay, now, since it's a sideways parabola, we're gonna wanna work with the Y values. So we could do one less than two, which is one, and two plus one, which is three, okay? So just know that, this is another instance. Anything that has to do with the vertex, just think about how it's reversed, okay? Um, and that includes finding points on either side of the vertex. That process is gonna be somewhat reversed. So when y is one here, it would be one minus two, which is negative one. Negative one squared is positive one, and one minus nine is negative eight. So that's right there. Um, there is symmetry. Um, so we're looking at negative eight right there. So let's plot some of these points. Negative eight comma one, that's right here. Uh, negative nine comma two, that's right here. That's literally the vertex. 
and then finally negative eight comma three is right here. So that all makes perfect sense, perfect sense. And then it's like this, right? So it goes like that. Uh, what else do they want? Minimum one point axis of symmetry. Okay, in this case, the axis of symmetry is, uh, that's another thing that's related to the vertex. So we've already established that the vertex is the negative nine comma two point here, right? That's the vertex. But so remember, anything related to the vertex when it comes to a sideways parabola is going to be the flipped version of what you would do with a normal upright parabola. So in an upright parabola, the axis of symmetry would be x equals negative 9. But in the sideways parabola, the axis of symmetry is going to be y equals 2 from that 2. Okay, so that's the axis of symmetry. And it makes perfect sense. Y equals 2 is a horizontal line. That's the equation of a horizontal line. It's the equation of a horizontal line that passes through the y value of 2. So there it is. Boom. Okay. Now, looking at the square root function here. Um, so, square root function right there. Square root function in general looks like this, where it's like, phew, okay? Uh, and we can say that the reference point is zero comma zero. It's, you know, it has the origin. It's going, you know, stuff going on with the origin. And by the way, that's the starting point, right? It's not just a reference point, but that's like the starting point. There's nothing to the left of it, right? Um, so we want the intercepts. Well, we all know what to do with that. That's going to be zero, zero. Uh, in this case, when x is zero, it's going to be square root of negative five. Uh, now, right away, uh, you cannot take the square root of a negative number. So we're going to say there is no uh, y. Uh, coordinate that would correspond with x equals zero. Uh, in fact, x is not allowed to be zero. So what we've just discovered is that there's no y-intercept. So this is gone, okay? Uh, now, let's see what happens when y is zero, though. Setting y equals zero, that would be zero equals radical x minus five minus three, adding three to both sides equals x minus five, radical x minus five, uh, we are then looking at squaring both sides, which is going to be 9 equals x minus 5. Adding 5 to both sides is 14. So we're looking at 14 there. So what that means is if this was extended and we had a 14 over here, then there would be a point on the graph right there. Okay. Uh, let's see. Do, 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 do. Intercepts, we just did that. Starting or ending point transformation of 0, 0. Right, so anytime they're asking for a transformation of zero, zero, that means go ahead and work with the fact that there was a zero, zero in the parent function, but unfortunately, uh, we applied horizontal transformations and vertical transformations. Okay, here's the parent function. There used to be zero, zero, here it is, but now we have horizontal transformations and vertical transformations to deal with. Horizontal transformations, it went five units to the right right five okay uh what else happened it went down three down three down three okay this is a five uh so the updated point uh this time we can put it on the top because this is the starting point so it's going to be zero plus five according to that horizontal transformation so that's five and then according to this vertical transformation we're going to be zero minus three so we're looking at negative three there, okay. So that's fine, okay, five comma negative three. In fact, let's plot that, five comma negative three, it's right there. Now, by the way, that makes perfect sense. It starts uh, starts here and then it goes up like that and then it hits that 14. Now, it looks like the teacher wants um, minimum two other points on the graph, strategically chosen, okay strategically chosen um well okay what does the teacher mean by strategically chosen that means the teacher wants you to choose additional x values that are going to be easy to work with now how do you know when it's easy to work with well it's an x value that would cause a perfect square here right 
So the professor wants you to choose an X value that would cause the radicam to be a perfect square. Well, one is a perfect square. So X, if X was six, it would be six minus five, which is one. And that would be a good contender. That would be a good choice. Um, so if X was six, um, you know, that would be a, that would be a good strategy. So we could say X is six and six minus five is one. Square root of one is just one, one minus three is negative two, so that's pretty good. What's another perfect square? Well, four is a perfect square. Uh, so what value of x would cause the radicand to be four? Well, if x was nine, it would be nine minus five, which is four. So nine is a good contender for x because nine minus five is four and the square root of four is two and two minus three is negative one. So those are strategically chosen points. Uh, we're looking at six comma negative two. Um, which is right here, and we're looking at nine, which will be over here, common negative one, okay? So that should be good as far as graphing. Uh, what else do they want? Um, domain range, two other points, okay. Uh, domain and range, so the domain is going to be all the x values from five to infinity, and the range is going to be all the y values from negative three up to positive infinity. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. Okay, let's see. Um, what else do we have? We have problem number seven. So one fourth, whatever, that whole thing. <laughs> okay, so it's another square root uh, situation. So we're just gonna follow the protocol. Well, what do they want? They want us to find the intercepts. Okay, we can do that right now. We're looking at zero comma uh, whatever, and then um, you know x comma zero. So let's find out when uh, x is zero, we're looking at uh, square root of negative three. So once again, that's the square root of a negative number, and we don't want that. So we're gonna say there is no uh, intercept there. Okay, there's no y-intercept. Um, however, we can set y equal to zero, so that would be zero equals one fourth times radical x minus three, multiply both sides by four, we would get zero equals x minus three, uh, square both sides, we would get zero equals x minus three, add three to both sides would give us x equals three, so clearly that is the, um, looks like the x-intercept. Okay, uh, so I don't mind just plotting that right now. That's fine. So plotting that. Let's see, what else do they want? They want starting or ending point, the transformation. Well, the old parent function had a starting point at zero comma zero, but we have all these transformations. We have horizontal, we have vertical transformations. Well, uh, the horizontal is three units to the right, three units to the right. Now, with regards to the vertical transformations, there's a vertical compression of one fourth. So I'm gonna call that VC colon one fourth. Now, vertical compression means it gets smushed downward, okay? And it's by a factor of one fourth. Now, what that means is that we're gonna be multiplying the Y coordinate times one fourth. Okay, that's important that you know that. So uh, let's update the new points. Uh, clearly, when you're looking at zero right here, well, it went to the right three, so that's going to be zero plus three, which is just three. And then with regards to this one, it's going to be zero times one fourth, which remains zero. Okay. Uh, so that's fine. Three comma zero. Uh, we already have that actually right here. But then the teacher wants other uh, strategically chosen points, right? So what would be strategically chosen? Well, anything that would cause this radicand here, anything that would cause this radicand to be a perfect square. Well, the perfect the first perfect square is one. So if X was a four, it'd be four minus three, which is one. So that would be good. Uh, so we're gonna call X four. So four minus three is one, square root of one is um, just one, and one times one fourth is one fourth. We're just gonna have to deal with the one fourth. Uh, the next perfect square is four, so what value of x would cause the radicand to be four? Well, uh, if x was a seven, then the radicand would be a four. 
So that would be seven minus three, which is four. Square root of four is just two, and two times one fourth is just one half. Okay, so I feel like we found some good points there. We're looking at four comma one fourth, which is right there. And we're looking at seven comma one half. So you can see it's very smushed, right? Uh, and it looks kind of like this, all right? So that's that. Um, domain and range, two other points in the graph strategically chosen. Okay, we just did that. We totally just did all that. Um, cool. So the domain, uh, clearly three to infinity. Uh, the range, clearly zero to positive infinity. Hopefully that makes sense. Okay, moving on to the next one. Uh, this is the first time we're dealing with a reflection right there uh, for the square root function. So uh, going through the motions, finding the intercepts first, we are looking at zero here, zero here. Uh, when x is zero, we're looking at zero plus seven, which is just seven, radical seven, which is just radical seven, negative radical seven minus two. So the best way to even say that is literally just negative radical seven minus two is kind of annoying, but that's the way it is. Uh, when y is zero, uh, we could, you know, set it up. Zero equals negative radical x plus seven there. And then we have our, what is it, minus two. So adding two to both sides, we have two equals negative radical x plus seven. Divide both sides by negative one, we have negative two equals radical x plus seven. Now, there might be a temptation to square both sides. Uh, but the reality is, is that you're actually done. Uh, there cannot be an x-intercept. And the reason is because if you're the one who's doing the square rooting on both sides, um, if you're the one who's applying a square root, then it's possible for one of the results to be negative. But if it's already a built-in square root that's already built into the problem, then the result has to be positive. Now, this is not positive. So therefore, there is no uh, intercept there, okay? So in other words, if the square root symbol is already built into the problem and you have a situation where you rearrange things and you see that there's a negative on one side, that's impossible because if the square root's already built into the problem, the result of the square rooting action has to be a positive number, okay? So it's kind of a weird phenomenon of math. Um, you know, to illustrate, if I had x squared equals 25, well, if I'm the one applying the square root, then I have to do this plus minus thing, okay? Because I'm the one who put the square root symbol, brought the square root symbol into the picture. However, if you have some um, problem that's literally just like, what does this equal, <laughs> okay? It's up to you to realize that the square root was already in the problem. So this is going to be positive, okay? So that equals just 5. Not negative 5 and 5, but just 5. Why? Because the square root symbol was already there. I didn't do it, right? It was already there. So this is the case where the square root symbol was already there, so it must be a positive number, so that's therefore impossible. Uh, starting on any point, okay. So the transformations... Um, the transformation of the original point of zero, zero, once again, the parent function used to be such that, oh, it used to start on zero, zero, but unfortunately we have horizontal and vertical transformations. So focusing on horizontal. Well, horizontal went to the left seven, went to the left seven. Uh, vertical, well, PEMDAS applies. You always want to do stuff that features multiplication. You want to mention things that feature multiplication more than you meant before you mention things that feature addition or subtraction. So uh, I'm not going to mention this downward shift of negative two just yet, because I want to mention this vertical reflection. This is a reflection across the x axis, which amounts to a vertical reflection. So we're going to say reflection with a big fat R. Um, and then I'm going to mention this downward shift of two units. It goes down two. Now, that's important, um, you know, probably. So well, definitely. So the updated points, zero minus seven, we're looking at negative seven. We have zero times negative one. So whenever there's a reflection, just multiply it by negative one, zero times negative one. 
So that's just going to be zero and then down two. So that's going to be negative two. So we're looking at negative seven comma negative two, which is right there. Uh, looking for other points. Well, um, let's try a couple points above, right? Let's try a couple points like negative six. Oh no, strategically chosen, right? We need strategically chosen. So the first, um, the first thing, uh, perfect square that we want this radicand to be is one. So what value of X would cause the radicand to be one? Well, if X was a negative six, well, that would work. If X was a negative six, that would work. So it'd be a uh, negative six plus seven, which is just positive one. Square root of positive one is one. And then there's a negative times that one. So it's a negative one and negative one minus two is negative three. The next perfect square is four. What value of X could cause this to be four? Well, if X was a negative three, then it would be four. So we're gonna call this X negative three. So negative three plus seven is positive four. Square root of four is two. Uh, uh, the negative applied to that two would be negative two. Negative two minus two is negative four. So I'm gonna say let's plot these. Negative six comma negative three. That's right here. And we're looking at negative three comma negative four, which is right there. Uh, we also know it passes through, um, you know, the y-axis here, which is kind of weird. Um, if you were to use your calculator for that one, it would be like there, okay? It would be like there-ish. So then you have to go do, 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 all the way through. Okay, uh, that should do it. Domain clearly from negative seven to infinity and range clearly from uh actually this one the range you got to be careful uh range has to do with the y values doesn't it go down forever so that means you have to start from the bottom and go up so the range you got to be careful that's negative infinity all the way up to negative two okay so then we have the next one which is this uh, what I would do first and foremost with something like that is I would factor out a negative so that it looks normal in there. So we have X minus six there. Okay, so you just be careful about that. Uh, you're going to want to do that. You're going to want the X to be first. And also you're going to want that X to be uh, not only positive, but to not have any coefficient in front of it. So here X is by itself. There's no coefficient. There's a negative one factored out, but the X is by itself inside the parentheses. So you're going to want that. Now, um, the uh, bottom line is uh, you can still find the intercepts fairly easily. Uh, when X is zero, uh, I'd actually prefer to use this. Six minus zero is just six. And then radical six is literally just radical six. Um, if we were to set y equal to zero, that would become zero equals radical six minus x. Um, and at this point, you can actually square both sides. That would be zero equals six minus x and x equals six. So that's fine. Okay. Um, basically, the important thing is that this number is not negative it can be zero though so we're looking at six comma zero zero comma six so that's fine so now we're going to want to find what's going on with the transformations and that's really where this new sort of revamped version comes into play because when you write it that way it's a little bit easier to see what the transformations are now let's remind ourselves the parent function has a starting point at zero comma zero but we have transformations to deal with uh, the horizontal transformations, it's all horizontal transformations. We have a horizontal shift six units to the right, but this is a horizontal reflection. Anytime we have a negative one like that, um, a negative, you know, whenever this becomes negative, um, that means it's a horizontal reflection. And since that has to do with multiplication, we're going to mention that first. So we have uh, reflection, and then we have to the right six, okay? Now, that's the order that you're going to want to apply everything as well. Okay, so let's update the points. Um, zero uh, reflected would just be um, zero times negative one, which is just zero. 
and the zero plus six is going to be six, and then the y coordinate remains the same. Now that actually checks out because we do have this point here. Uh, now we are going to need two additional strategically chosen points, right? So let's go back to this and we're going to ask ourselves, okay, well, what point, what x value would cause the radicand to be the first perfect square, which is one? Well, if x was five, that would totally work, right? So we could say uh, if x was five, it would be six minus five, which is just one square root of one is just one. Uh, now, now we're going to want this radicand to be four. So what value of x would cause the radicand to be four? Well, if it was six minus two, well, then the radicand would be four. So two is another good strategically chosen x value. Six minus two is four, and the square root of four is just two. So we're going to put a two right there. So now we have our points. We have six comma zero, which is right here. We have five comma one, which is right here. And we have two comma two, which is right here. And that actually makes sense. So this thing, again, it's horizontally reflected, right? Uh, and it goes through zero comma root six. Well, root six is like, I don't know, square root of nine is three. Um, you know, well, two squared is four, uh, three squared is nine. So it's going to be between four and nine somewhere. I don't care, whatever. It's like something like that. Use your calculator for that part. Uh, looking at the domain, <clears throat> it goes from negative infinity, right? Negative infinity all the way up to six. Please be careful with that. Looking at the range, it goes from, it starts at six, it starts at zero rather, and then it goes up to positive infinity. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. Okay, this is the first time we've dealt with a cube root. Now we've dealt with a cubic function, which is here, but not a cube root function. Now the parent function of a cube root would be something like this. All right, so that's important to sort of have a general idea about. Now, as it pertains to the criteria, the Q root section is here. We are going to need the intercepts. Let's start with that. We've got X and Y, we've got zero, we've got zero. Okay, when X is zero, it would be negative eight under there. Q root of negative eight is negative two. Negative two plus one is negative one. Um, if we were to set y equal to zero, that would be cube root of x minus eight plus one, uh, subtracting one from both sides. We have negative one equals the cube root of x minus eight. At that point, we'd have to cube both sides. And as a result of that, we would have negative one equals x minus eight. Adding eight to both sides would give us a seven, and seven equals x. Uh, so therefore, this would be a seven right there. I'm going to plot these now. Zero comma negative one's right there, and seven comma zero is right there. Okay. Now, um, what else do we need? We need a reference point transformations. Uh, well, the reference point on the parent function would once again be this zero comma zero there. So parent function used to be zero comma zero but then we have horizontal and vertical transformations so what are the horizontal transformations here well let's look a little bit more closely so the horizontal transformations we have a, a shift to the right eight units right shift to the right eight units uh, vertical transformation we have a vertical shift upward of one okay uh, so cool so updating the reference point, uh, 0 plus 8 is 8, and 0 plus 1 is 1. So that's the new reference point. So that's at 8, comma 1, which is right there. Okay. Now, the teacher wants, um, let's see, one point on either side of the reference point. Well, in a way, I feel like we already satisfied it. I mean, we do have this point, right? I don't know. Is that good enough? Yeah, probably. So uh, one point on either side of the reference point. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, put 8 comma 1 in the middle. Okay, 8 comma 1 in the middle. Okay, and then we'll try out, we'll try out, I don't know, what should we try out? 
Hmm. Well, you know, what are some perfect cubes? Uh, one is a perfect cube. So what value of X would cause uh, this to be one under there? Well, nine would work, right? So nine minus eight is one. Cube root of one is just one. One plus one is two. So that's a good one. Um, what's another uh, perfect cube? Well, uh, negative one would work. So what value of X would cause this to be negative one? Well, if X was seven, right? And already we know that that's going to be um, negative one cubed, cube root of negative one, which is negative one, negative one plus one is zero. We already kind of knew that seven zeros on this graph. I'm hoping that that's fine. Um, but the new point is definitely nine comma two. So that's like here. So the reality is, is this graph uh, kind of goes like that and then it like cuts across and then it goes up like that and then it goes like that. Okay, forever. So that's what's happening with that one. Intercepts, one point on the other side of the reference point. Okay, so the domain clearly negative infinity to positive infinity, the range actually also negative infinity to positive infinity. Hopefully that makes sense. Okay, looking at this one here, problem number 11. Um, so that is this okay now that's a semicircle um if it's negative then it's the bottom half of the semicircle if it's positive it's the top half of the semicircle in this case it's negative so we know it's going to be the bottom half i'm going to say to memorize this is actually pretty smart um so the radius is literally going to be five right because r squared is 25 so the radius has to be five now they do want the radius right they want the radius. The radius is five, okay? Uh, what else do they want? They want the center and three points on the graph, domain and range, okay? So how can you kind of mess with this thing? Well, it's this so far, right? We've got 25 minus x squared. And if you want the center, uh, you might want to just go ahead and um turn it into the equation of a circle now how would you do that well you could square both sides right now and as a result you would have a y squared over here uh the negative one would cancel because it'd be negative one times negative one and then the square root symbol would disappear so we would have 25 minus x squared at that point if you want to turn it into the equation of a circle add the x squared to both sides so we'd have x squared plus y squared equals 25 and then um, to make it even resemble a, a circle equation even more it would be x minus 0 squared plus y minus 0 squared and that equals we could say 5 squared right because 5 is the radius so that looks a lot like the equation of a circle which my student at home should memorize where hk is the center and r is the radius right so hk is the center well h is that number k is that number so we're looking at zero comma zero as the center okay uh, i would say it's worth plotting at this point zero comma zero is right there uh, we also know the radius is five so it goes over here and it goes over here and we know it's a semicircle that faces downwards, so it's got to hit that five as well. And by the way, those are the three other points that you need. Okay, so here's your graph for this one. And I do believe we are satisfying the requirements because what do they say? They want the center. We got it. The radius. We got it. Three points on the graph. We just found it. Boom, boom, boom. Right. Domain and range. Well, the domain would be everything from negative five to positive five and the range would be remember always start with the smallest number or the lesser number that would be negative five all the way up to zero right because this is the range of y values that are represented on the graph okay so that is how you do that one okay now we have an absolute value 
uh, function. Now the parent function for an absolute value function is y equals absolute value of x. And that looks like something like that, like a perfect V like that. Uh, so that's the reality of that. Um, we are now here and let's see what the professor wants from us. So we have the intercepts. Okay, fine. Um, let's uh, set that up. Zero, zero. When X is zero, we're looking at a negative two in there. Absolute value of negative two is just positive two. Negative positive two is a negative two. Negative two plus five is three. Um, we also know that when Y equals zero, we could solve this. Now you do have to be careful with this. You're gonna to have to be very skilled with your absolute value stuff. Uh, subtracting five from both sides would be negative five equals negative absolute value of X minus two. Then we could divide both sides by this negative one here. That would make it five equals absolute value of X minus two. Now, once you've got the absolute value thing by itself, at that point, you have to split it into two separate equations. First equation is just the regular thing, okay? But then the other equation is you have to turn that 5 into a negative 5, okay? Uh, then you have to solve for both. We're looking at x equals 7, and we're looking at x equals negative 3. So negative 3 and seven okay those are the x-intercepts so the y-intercept is zero comma three and the x-intercepts are negative three zero and seven zero i say let's graph this zero comma three is right there negative three comma zero is right here and seven comma zero is right there okay fine uh, what else do they want? Well, they want the vertex. Well, the vertex is relatively easy to see what it is. Uh, it's kind of like the vertex form thing of, you know, the, the uh, parabola that was in vertex form. Well, this is in vertex form. The vertex would be 2 comma 5. So, awesome. 2 comma 5. Let's grab that as well. That's right here. Okay, good. So what else do they want? They want the range, minimum one point on either side. We'll worry about the range after we graph the whole thing. Minimum one point on either side of the vertex. Okay, fine, x, y. Uh, we're gonna put the vertex in the middle. The vertex we already discovered is two comma five. Let's try out one, let's try out three. And this will be symmetrical. As you can see, the v is symmetrical. So whatever this y value is, is gonna be the same as this y value. So let's actually try one. When you plug in one for X, that would be one minus two, which is uh, negative one. Absolute value of negative one is positive one, but the negative gets applied to that. So that becomes negative one again. And then negative one plus five is four. So that's a four, which makes this a four. So one comma four exists on this graph. That's right here and three comma four exists on this graph, which is right there. So that is what's going on there. Um, we could certainly connect the dots at this point. We're looking at something that looks like this. And the domain, all real numbers, because it goes to the left forever, goes to the right forever. Uh, the range, however, would be from negative infinity all the way up to that five, it looks like, right? And it includes five, so it gets a bracket. Okay, so that is how to do that one. Okay, so let's see. Looking at this one here, once again, absolute value. Um, going through the protocol intercepts, we have zero, we have zero. Uh, when X is zero, it's going to be zero plus six, which is six. 
Absolute value of 6 is just 6. 1 third of 6 is 2. 2 minus 4 is negative 2. Uh, setting y equal to 0 would be 1 third times x plus 6 minus 4, adding 4 to both sides. Um, now, to get rid of that 1 third, we should then multiply everything by 3. So that's going to become 12 equals x plus 6 in absolute value symbols. Now, as you may recall, you must then split this. You have 12, just the normal situation. And then you have a negative 12. So um, 12 minus 6 is 6, so that's this. Um, negative 12 minus 6 is negative 18. So we have negative 18 and 6 there. So therefore, let's start plotting some of these. 0 comma negative 2 is right there. Um, 6 comma 0 is clearly right here. And then we have negative 18, so you can imagine negative 18, and we would have a point right there, fine. Um, what else? We want the vertex. Well, the vertex, relatively easy to find. That would be negative 6 comma negative 4, okay? Negative 6 comma negative 4. I'm going to write that in my chart. Negative 6, comma, negative 4. Now, where is that? Negative 6, comma, negative 4. That is right here. Okay. Um, what else do they want? Minimum one point on either side of the vertex. Okay, fine. We will say negative 5, and we will say negative 7. There is symmetry as well. So if x was negative 5, well, then it would be negative 5 plus 6, which is negative 1. Absolute value of negative 1, <coughs> pardon me, is negative, um, is just positive 1. And then it will be 1 third times positive 1, which is 1 third. Uh, and this can be 1 third minus 4, which is really the same thing as 1 third minus um, 12 over 3 which is really negative 11 over 3. So that's going to be negative 11 over 3. And due to symmetry, this would be negative 11 over 3. Now, uh, negative 11 over 3 is really 3 point something or negative 3 point something. So it would be negative 5 comma negative 3 point something. So there'd be another point right there. Uh, and same with this point right there. Now, hopefully your teacher doesn't mind that. And then you would be dealing with, you know, V-shape like that, okay? Now, the domain is all real numbers, and the range is clearly uh, from negative 4, I believe, yes, up to infinity because these go on forever upward, okay? I should really, you know, make it look normal, but the reality is, is they go up forever. So, parentheses. Okay, so that's how you do that one. Okay, so now we have this uh, circle. That's a circle right there, uh, which is right here. Now, I actually think this one's going to be easy, even though it looks like maybe it should be the hardest one. Uh, it's, I think, not going to be. So here's the circle equation, center radius, four points on the graph. Okay, fine. Friggin' easy. Center is negative 3, comma, 6. The radius is the square root of that 16, which is 4. Boom! Done. Let's start plotting. Negative 3, negative 6. That's right here. Um, and then it's the radius of 4. So the teacher wants 4 points on the graph. So in other words, count upward due to the radius. Count downward in accordance with the radius. Count to the left in accordance with the radius. Count to the right in accordance with the radius. Radius is four, so we're looking at one, two, three, four. There's a point right there. Radius is four, so we're looking at one, two, three, four. There's a point right there. One, two, three, four right there. One, two, three, four right there. Those are your points, and then you can connect them, and you can mention what they are. Uh, we're looking at negative seven, comma, negative six. We are looking at um, 
was it negative three comma negative six or negative two rather negative three comma negative two that's the top one uh we are looking at one comma negative six that's the one on the right and the bottom point is um negative three comma let's see negative six minus four negative ten that should be a negative ten right there uh those are your four points right there okay that's pretty easy so that's that one so that will do it for today uh hopefully that was helpful uh if i made any mistakes which i do not think i did let me know in the comments below and hope you guys have uh, fun with math and life and i will talk to you soon take it easy